Hello everyone, and welcome to the remastered edition of the first episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Colonel Walter E. Kurtz from Apocalypse Now. I know what some of you must be thinking right now. Vile, is this a cop-out? Are you just rehashing old videos because you've run out of ideas? No, that's not the case at all. These remastered videos are going to be few and far between, and they aren't meant to be replacements for weekly Analyzing Evil videos. I won't be taking down the original videos, and I'm not sure just yet at which video I'll be stopping at, but I've had the idea for some time to not only bring up the quality of my older videos with the better equipment I have now, but to also include some inputs from you in those previous videos that I found valuable, or that changed my opinion on certain aspects of these characters. And of course, so I could also include anything that you mentioned I forgot in those previous videos. So with that in mind, apart from any of the alterations I make to this video based on your comments, this video will be nearly identical to the previous video, though I will be referring to the Redux version of the film as it does give us a bit more information, and I also changed up some of my wording a bit when I deemed it necessary. But before we get started, let's first talk about our sponsor for this video, Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. They offer a wide array of comprehensive lessons that help you reach your language goals, and they offer perhaps the most crucial tool when it comes to achieving fluency, real-life conversations with native speakers. This is one of the greatest perks that comes with using Babbel, and it's easy to get started with daily lessons that will have you speaking a new language in only three weeks. Enchanté, je suis Marc. Enchanté, je suis Marc. Pardon? Vous êtes Marion? Pardon, vous êtes Marion? Babbel offers a ton of languages to choose from, as well as several different subscriptions, like their lifetime subscription. Babbel has already helped me with my Spanish, and now I'm diving into French, so it's that much easier for me to communicate with people almost anywhere I go in the world. Spring is a great time of year to reinvent yourself and learn something new. And right now you can do just that with Babbel by clicking the link down in the description where you can get up to 60% off of your subscription. Again, that's up to 60% off of your subscription to Babbel by clicking the link down below. Thank you Babbel for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, please enjoy the enhanced version of the first episode of this series. To get a better understanding of this character, we must first briefly explore the source of Francis Ford Coppola's inspiration for making this film, and for the character of Kurtz, The Heart of Darkness, by Joseph Conrad. This novella has been analyzed and picked apart many times over the last hundred plus years, and if you're looking to better identify yourself with the themes and contents of not just this video, but the film Apocalypse Now, I suggest that you give it a read, or watch one of the many videos and lectures about it you can find online that gives a full breakdown of the book. I know some of you expressed your desire for a video on Kurtz as he appears in this novella in the previous video, but I have much bigger fish to fry at the moment, so know that he will have a video made about him in the future. But for now, let's get back to that brief summary. In the book, Kurtz is not a military man. Instead, he's an ivory trader during the Belgian rule of the Congo, which at that time was known as the Free State of Congo. Kurtz is talked about in the first chapter of the book as an amazing man, one who will surely rise high in the company that the narrator, Marlowe, is a part of. As we read further into the book, we discover that Kurtz has gone off the rails due to a suspected illness. Upon finding Kurtz, Marlowe discovers that he has set himself up as a sort of deity that is being worshipped by the natives. Kurtz has gone mad from the illness, but but also from being isolated in the jungle for a long period of time. The darkness referred to in the title of the book is the jungle. Kurtz has remained in the center of it for so long that he has become mad, and in his madness, he has begun using methods that the company considers unsound. This is only a very brief description of the character of Kurtz from the Heart of Darkness, but the parallels between the two will become quite apparent as we continue on with this video. Now, on to the main event. In the beginning of the film, the main character, Captain Willard, is given a briefing on Colonel Kurtz. Here he has played two recordings that are allegedly made by Kurtz. In the first recording, Kurtz describes a dream or a nightmare he has been having in which a snail crawls along the edge of a straight razor, yet still survives. The second recording is then played of him saying, and I quote, We must kill them. We must incinerate them. Pig after pig. Cow after cow. Village after village. And they call me an assassin. What do you call it when the assassins accuse the assassin? They lie, and they lie. And we have to be merciful to those who lie. I hate them. I do hate them. 
This is our first encounter with Kurt, so to speak, and we can glean a few key things about his state of mind from these recordings. Now, the dream he describes in the first recording can, and has been interpreted in many different ways. These first lines of dialogue are meant to paint us a faint portrait of Kurt's in our minds early on, and the dream is perhaps the most important of the two recordings in achieving this for the viewer. In my opinion, the most rational way to interpret the meaning of his dream is to first review the second recording in order to understand his dream. In the second recording, Kurtz is describing the methods he feels are necessary to bring the war to a swift end and vilifying those who call him a villain, the US military. Now, a large part of the reason that the United States was ultimately unsuccessful in Vietnam was due to their failure to adapt to the situation and instead attempting to fight the war as they had fought many wars in the past. Kurtz realizes this, and he feels the best way to fight the war is a more personal and measured approach. With the information we obtained from the second recording, and one more key fact, that being that a snail is actually able to survive while crawling on the edge of a straight razor, we can deduce that the snail is the US military and the razor is Vietnam. While the snail will survive, it gains nothing by being in this situation, nor winning anything. It simply just is. I feel that this is an accurate way to describe the ultimate outcome of the Vietnam War for the United States. While we lost a great number of lives, the United States as a whole did not lose as much as other countries have during similar conflicts, like, for example, the Soviet Union during its time in Afghanistan, a defeat that jumpstarted the collapse of their country. To Kurtz, this outcome is unacceptable, as later on we'll see that his career is very distinguished, and he has found victory in virtually every situation he has ever been in. During this war, he's seeing the institution he's dedicated his life to fail, fail to adapt to a new situation, and thus ultimately failing in its main goal, victory. This to Kurtz is nothing short of heresy. Now, as I said before, there are many different interpretations of what we've discussed so far. And as I said in the original video, I asked you to let me know your interpretations down in the comments, and I was intrigued by a few of them. Flashjack Max said, Aside from interpreting what his dream means, I think the fact that Kurtz is taking the time to describe his dream at all says something of his state of mind. He's a man searching for meaning and a hidden truth behind his actions. He's looking to ephemeral and nebulous concepts to explain why he's feeling the way he feels and why he's doing what he's doing. To add to that line of thinking, Olivia Pete said, I think the snail dream is an allegory for being on the edge of his sanity. If he leans too far to one side, he'll lose balance and fall, but he's still unknowingly being being torn apart if he stays center. And I couldn't agree more, and I think this adds to my own interpretation of his dream. He's both watching the country he dedicated his life to operate on the edge of a razor, and he's also struggling with his own choices, ever conscious of the truth he's been searching for, and of the delicate path that he now walks, and how it is tearing him apart. But he's afraid to deviate from that path as he fears losing his balance and falling to ruin. So at this point, we've come to understand two things about Kurtz. That he has lost faith in the United States to conduct the war in a manner he deems proper, and from the input of our friends in the comments, that he's keenly aware that he's losing his grip on his own sanity. Now later on in the film, we find out from a dossier given to Captain Willard that Colonel Kurtz was by all means an exceptional man. He was third generation West Point, top of his class. It's not said by Willard, but if you pause the movie and read the dossier, it also says he obtained a master's degree from Harvard. His thesis, The Philippines Insurrection, American Foreign Policy in Southeast Asia. He was being groomed for a top position in the military, a general, chief of staff. He could have been anything. But in 1966, he chose to join the Special Forces and head to Vietnam. At a little over the first hour in the film, Willard is reading through some of Kurtz's files and news articles that were written about him. And here we learn that at 38 years old, he went through jump school, which is the US Army Air born school for paratroopers. He had to apply three times for it and threatened to resign, but he got in, ensuring his admission to the Green Berets and the front lines of the Vietnam War. What's incredible about this feat is that to graduate from this school, as Willard says, is no easy task, and for a man of his age to do so proves the tenacity and force of will that Kurtz has burning within him. After he arrived in Vietnam for his first tour, the colonel immediately showed himself to be a man very much inclined to do things his way, no matter what his superiors might have to say about it. And in October 1967, when he was on a special assignment in Kantum province, he staged Operation Archangel with combined local forces, which was a major success, a success he achieved of his own accord, without permission from the higher-ups. Because of this act of disobedience, they almost forced him to resign, but instead, they made him a full colonel when knowledge of his exploits 
exploits became public knowledge. In the late summer of 1968, Kurtz's patrols in the Highlands were coming under frequent ambush, and their camp started to fall apart. In November, he ordered three Vietnamese men and one woman to be assassinated, and two of these men were colonels in the South Vietnamese Army. Rather than going through the proper channels and bringing them to trial, he chose to act of his own accord and mete out justice as he saw fit, which of course, he was vilified for. However, enemy activity in his sector subsequently dropped to zero. The army tried one last time to bring him into the fold, but their efforts failed. Now from these actions alone, we can assume that Colonel Kurtz is a man of action. And a letter that he wrote to his son that includes mention of his assassination of the four Vietnamese soldiers and his criminalization over this act confirms this. In the letter, he writes that he has been accused of murdering four Vietnamese whom he tracked for several months, accumulating evidence, and finding them to be double agents. There are a couple interesting sentences in this letter that provide us more insight into the mind of Kurtz. He writes, In a war, there are many moments for compassion and tender action, and there are many moments for ruthless action. What is often called ruthless may in many circumstances be only clarity, seeing clearly what there is to be done and doing it directly, quickly, awake, looking at it. From these sentences, we can now confirm something that is undeniable. Kurtz is a man of action. From the actions we've learned about so far, as well as the recordings we heard, we can also assume that he'll stop at nothing in his pursuit of victory. Our last stop, before getting to Kurtz himself, is the ravings of the photographer. For the sake of time, I'm going to tell you all of the important things the photographer has to say about Kurtz now, even though all of this is not said immediately when we first meet him. Most of what the photographer says of Kurtz is blind adulation, calling him a genius and above him in many ways. But there are a few key things he says about him that are of significance. The first is this quote, Sometimes you'll say hello to him, and he'll walk right by you, and he won't even notice you. And then suddenly, he'll grab you and throw you in a corner, and he'll say, Do you know that if is the middle word? in life. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you. So hearing this, it's not only the colonel's actions that show us he is a very temperamental and spontaneous man, but the photographer's words here are also meant to convey to us a core piece of Kurtz's philosophy. Keeping yourself on the right path, even while being judged and blamed. This is what Kurtz does. He acts, keeping himself true to what he believes is the best course, even if he might question himself at times. Upon coming on severed heads, that decorate the steps leading up to the temple. The photographer tells Willard and his men, the heads, you're looking at the heads. Sometimes he goes too far, and he's the first one to admit it. This implies that in some ways, Kurtz is not fully in control of the actions he takes. Whether due to madness or rage, he sometimes takes actions that he later goes on to regret. The last bit of important information we get from the photographer is said to Willard after he's been locked up in a cage. The man is clear in his head, but his soul is mad. He's dying, I think. He hates all this. This. He hates it. It's this quote, and what Willard later says about Kurtz, that really sends a message. I've never seen a man so broken up and ripped apart. This is the final description of Kurtz in this film that I feel is of any worth. It tells us something that the men higher up in the military could not possibly begin to understand. For in their eyes, all that Kurtz is doing is mad, unhinged, unsound, evil. For Kurtz, it's necessary, it's right, it's what must be done, yet he is in torment. His mind is not one that does this out of some wanton cruelty, rather he does what needs to be done, no matter the cost, whether that be for others or for himself. The rest of this video will be focused on drawing conclusions about the character of Kurtz from the dialogue he provides himself. During Willard's first interaction with Kurtz, the dialogue is mostly personal, but one thing that he says to Willard in this first meeting stands out in particular. Have you ever considered any real freedoms? Freedoms from the opinions of others, even the opinions of yourself. Kurtz has been freed, freed from even his own opinion of himself. What you think of him does not matter. What he thinks of himself does not matter. Not especially the voice in the back of his head that's meekly calling to him and judging his actions. None of that matters to him anymore. All that matters is victory, victory at any cost. Later on, after Kurtz has delivered the severed head of Chef onto Willard's lap, we come to him in the temple reading a very famous poem called The Hollow Men by T.S. Eliot. We're only given a few lines of the poem by Kurtz, but these these lines hold great importance, and this poem, along with The Heart of Darkness, were two of the biggest inspirations for the film itself. The lines we hear in the film from Kurtz are the following. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together. Headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless. 
as wind in dry grass, or rats feet over broken glass, in our dry cellar, shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. These lines are meant to give the viewer an accurate depiction of the state that Kurtz has devolved into. He has become a shade, a ghost haunting the mortal plane, an invisible being not fit to ever take form again in the world as we know it, a man whose voice is lost among the throng of the voices of the many, a man who, despite his best efforts, is doomed. The penultimate moment we see Kurtz before his death is perhaps the most pivotal moment in the entire film when it comes to understanding his character. Here he makes a speech to Captain Willard. I've seen horrors, horrors that you've seen, but you have no right to call me a murderer. You have a right to kill me, you have a right to do that, but you have no right to judge me. It's impossible for words to describe what is necessary to those who do not know what horror means. Horror has a face, and you must make a friend of horror. Horror and moral terror are your friends. If they are not, then they are enemies to be feared. They are truly enemies. I remember when I was with Special Forces, seems a thousand centuries ago, we went into a camp to inoculate some children. We'd left the camp after we had inoculated the children for polio, and this old man came running after us, and he was crying. He couldn't say. We went back there, and they had come and hacked off every inoculated arm. They... They... They were in a pile. A pile of little arms. And I remember, I cried. I wept like some grandmother. I wanted to tear my teeth out. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I want to remember it. I never want to forget it. And then I realized, like I was shot with a diamond bullet through my forehead, and I thought, my god, the genius of that. The genius. The will to do that. Perfect. Genuine. Complete. Crystalline. Pure. And then I realized, they were stronger than we, because they could stand it. These were not monsters. These were men, trained cadres. These men who fought with their hearts, who have families, who have children, who are filled with love, the strength to do that. If I had ten divisions of those men, then our troubles here would be over quickly. You have to have men who are moral, and at the same time, who are able to utilize their primordial instincts to kill without feeling, without passion, without judgment, because it's judgment that defeats us. Here is where at last we receive the full picture of Colonel Kurtz, a man who would use violence and terror for the sake of the moral greater good, a man torn down to his very core because of the things he feels he must do. For Kurtz is above all, in his eyes, a moral man, yet morality has abandoned him. His final line of dialogue before he's murdered by Willard is a testament to this. We train young men to drop fire on people, but their commanders won't allow them to write obscenities on their airplanes because it's obscene. This is a man who wants to see the success of the the institution he gave his life for, a man who has lived with the inefficiency, the inadequacy, and the hypocrisy of that very institution for so long, a man who has finally become broken and unable to stand it any longer, a man who has been accused of being a monster by an organ of death that itself could be labeled monstrous. A man who has seen, felt, and lived horror. And above all, a man who has turned to the very thing he despises in order to fight it. In the end, Colonel Kurtz may have drawn some very sobering conclusions. That war is ugly, and sometimes perhaps in order to stop an ugly thing, you need to become ugly yourself. To engage yourself and those under your command in decisive action that could very well bring a swift end to the fighting. In the process, you create a soul wrecked beyond imagining whose insanity stems from their noble, but mad desire to end the suffering of your own by inflicting that suffering back upon your enemies tenfold. Shattered by all this, this great man who's fallen so far is left with only one thing in his final moments. Thank you all for tuning in to this remastered episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Colonel Kurtz? Did I miss anything again? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you liked this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.